Welcome to another in a series of Sound Ideas from Simon & Schuster. Dr. Norman Vincent Peale has long been known to audiences around the world for his inspiring messages of positive thinking and confidence. In his bestseller, You Can If You Think You Can, he continues this theme with stories of people who have met life's challenges by facing problems squarely and by turning setbacks into personal victories. Our program begins with a few words from Dr. Peale about his own source of inspiration for this work, a lifelong fascination with people who have come through on the other side of adversity. He will then read selected passages from his book. You'll hear him talk about the qualities that winning personalities often have in common. We'll look at some of the methods these people use to turn their problems around. Now, Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. A long time ago, I developed what might be called an obsession. The obsession is to try to help people get the best from life and learn how to live with its hard experiences in a creative manner. Personally, I've always been fascinated by the tremendous qualities in the individual and by the amazing things human beings can do with themselves. To me, this is so exciting, so fabulous, that I cannot help coming forward once again with more stories of people who have really done something remarkable, especially in releasing their own potential. Having known many men and women and having had the opportunity to watch them overcome problems and come up with real values, I've become aware that certain principles are always involved in creative outcomes. What I hope to do now is outline some of these dynamic and workable principles and to encourage you to put them to work for yourself. I would like to help you see that you can if you think you can. Chapter 1. What is a problem, really? Some people seem to feel wouldn't life be simply wonderful if we had easier problems? Or better still, no problems at all? But is this necessarily true? Would we be better off if such were the case? A few years back, I encountered a friend of mine who was, as he put it, absolutely fed up. When I asked what was bothering him, he burst out, Problems, 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 nothing but problems. I am sick of them. He proposed that if he could get rid of all his problems, he would actually pay me a thousand dollars. Well, I thought about it, and I finally came up with a solution that seemed, if not great, at least realistic. George, I said, I know a place where there are a hundred thousand people and not a single solitary one of them has a problem. Naturally, my friend was immediately enthusiastic. Boy, that's for me, he said. Lead me to this place. Okay, I replied. Let's go over to the cemetery. Well, I have yet to receive my thousand dollars, so I guess George didn't really go for the idea. But the fact is, nobody in a cemetery has a problem. For them, life's fitful fever is over. They rest from their labors. They couldn't care less what you and I read in the daily paper or hear on radio or TV. They have no problems at all, not a one. But they are dead. Like George, many people assume that a problem is nothing but bad news. But as one of America's outstanding idea men pointed out, every problem contains the seeds of its own solution. With the right attitude and the right approach, you'll find that a solution is built into every problem. In fact, 
I'll go so far as to say problems can be downright good for us. Does that sound shocking? I wonder sometimes what has come over this great country of ours. We're the descendants of a once great breed of men and women who had problems and had them aplenty. But did they whine and whimper and crawl through life on their hands and knees, pitifully demanding that someone take care of them? Not on your life. They stood solidly on their feet, and they took care of themselves. And in the process, they built the greatest economy in the history of the world. Could it be that the breed has run out? Have we come to a time when we are so superficial in our thinking that we actually believe we're being mistreated by some cruel fate because we have to deal with problems? Our forefathers were philosophers. They knew that problems are inherent in the structure of the universe. They realized that the purpose of the Creator is to make strong people who have what it takes to face the ups and downs of human existence, people who stand up to the harsh facts of life on earth, people who don't back away and fold up, but instead who deal with life's challenges creatively and forthrightly. Our forefathers understood that the only way to make strong people is through struggle. One grows tough mentally and spiritually by putting up a strong resistance to hardships, to obstacles, to suffering. As a person moves from childhood to maturity, problems and challenges play an enormous role in development. Without obstacles, children would have nothing against which to test their mettle. Like muscles that need exercise to grow strong, so character needs challenge in order to mature. Grappling effectively with problems enhances a person's insights, strengths, and general ability to live constructively. Have you ever considered how you usually react to common problems? Do you whine and get bitter and pity yourself? Is your attitude more or less, why me? If that sounds like a fair description of yourself, I'd like you to consider the fact that there are people who calmly accept problems as part of the pattern of life who confidently believe they are equal to the problems that confront them, who even think problems might be turned to their advantage. These are the people who embody the principle, you can if you think you can. Perhaps the most important thing these people have going for them is their attitude. I'd say their approach to life is pretty well summed up in this old saying, when fate throws a dagger at you, there are two ways to catch it, by the blade or by the handle. Catch the dagger by the blade and it may cut you, perhaps injure you. But if you catch it by the handle, you can use it to fight your way through the obstacles ahead. The next time you're faced with a problem, try a new approach. Why not seize the problem by the handle? In other words, let the challenge rouse your fighting spirit. You can't get anywhere without a good fighting spirit, so get it going. With fire in your heart, you can stir up your latent powers and prompt yourself into action. Nobody can escape problems, but the trick is to try to look at them differently. If you can accept them as part of life and then figure out how to rise above them, you are miles ahead toward peace of mind and a chance to accomplish your goals. Adopting a new attitude toward problems is the first step in conquering them. Now Dr. Peel will talk about finding the confidence to maintain that approach.
It was Ralph Waldo Emerson who said, The first secret of success is self-trust, and how right he was. For if you want to meet your problems squarely, you have to have something to stand on. You need a foundation of inner fortitude and self-confidence. But sad to say, those who are afflicted by terrible clouds of self-doubt and fear must number in the millions. Countless people hold themselves back from all they could achieve simply because they feel they can't cope. Their attitude is, I just don't have what it takes. According to most experts who deal with such issues, the chief problem stems from a deep inner conflict, a sense of inadequacy and inferiority, a feeling that the ordinary problems of human existence are just too much. Whenever I think about this matter of confidence, my mind goes back to Vince Lombardi, one of the greatest football coaches in American athletic history. He was one of those men who inspired everyone, players and fans alike. I remember Lombardi told me, there's one thing I always want above all else, to win. There's no sense playing a game unless you aim to win it. All your playing, working, thinking, everything should be geared to winning. Speaking of the job of a coach, he said, the big thing is to make men, men who want to win and who are willing to give all they've got to roll up a victory, men who believe in themselves and in their team and who always think confidently. Believers sweep everything before them, he said. One of his players recalls how Lombardi told the team one day, football is a game of abandon. You run with complete abandon. You care nothing for anybody or anything in your way. And when you get close to the goal line, your abandon is intensified. Nothing, not a tank, nor a wall, nor 11 men shall stop you from getting across that goal line. Under his inspired leadership, it's no wonder the Green Bay Packers became one of the most astonishing teams in football history. And when you think about it, isn't that how you make something of your job or your goals as well? You don't fool around doubtfully. You don't dabble hesitantly. You go at it with abandon. You go all out holding nothing back. You make up your mind to win, nothing less. You believe in yourself. You have self-confidence. Remember, confidence draws results. It has powerful magnetism. So what's stopping you? What's keeping you from going at it all out, from running with abandon toward your goal? What are you afraid of? There are two massive forces competing for control of the mind, fear and faith. But of the two, faith is the stronger, much stronger. The most foolproof method for ridding yourself of doubts and fears is to cancel them out with faith. And faith is not merely a temporary pain reliever. It's the cure, the only cure for fear. A young mother once wrote to me about her experience with fear and faith. This woman lived on the bank of a deep and swift-moving stream, but despite this, she had a terrible fear of the water. She'd never learned to swim and avoided the water as much as possible. One day, she was watching her three small children in the backyard when her youngest, a three-year-old, came in muddy from playing. She changed the girl's clothes with one hand because the other hand had been hurt in an accident 
and would be useless for weeks. She sent her out again to play with her brothers and sisters, and when she went to check on the children later, she discovered that Janie was missing. The boys and girls told her she'd gone to the creek. The woman raced to the water, and there, in a quiet eddy, between the twisting current racing to a waterfall and the safety of the bank, she spotted a dot of orange, her baby, drifting as though asleep. The woman screamed a prayer to the Lord for help and plunged in. She couldn't touch bottom in the freezing, churning water and again prayed for help. She grasped a few marsh roots with one hand and finally made her way to the child. Then with her other hand, the useless one, she grabbed the still child and hurled her up on the bank. The little girl slid back into the water. Again, the mother hurled the child up. This time, the landing was secure, and she heard the welcome sounds of a gasp and a whimper and finally a wail. The child began breathing again as the woman dragged herself out. Not until now did her hand feel any pain or did she realize what she had done. Surely we've all heard stories like this. A moment of crisis and a loved one's life is at stake. An ordinary person suddenly discovers a power within, a power greater than fear. I call this the adrenaline of faith, a powerful shot of faith that bursts out and eliminates fear completely. If the human mind reacts in this manner under crisis, why can't it be trained to do equally incredible things without the crisis element in the routine circumstances of everyday life? But the mind can be trained. It can indeed. And how? By practice. By practicing faith rather than fear until the faith reaction becomes habitual. We just have to change our thoughts and think that we can do something. Don't let your fears push you around. Be determined. Stand up to them and deny them the power to dominate you, even in the less than dramatic lives that most of us live. Then in your own way, you will perform amazingly. One way to prepare yourself for moments of fear is to realize that all the resources you need are in your mind. They're waiting for you to summon them. I'll never forget the time I discovered this vital principle for myself. It was some years after World War I, and I was asked to give the invocation at a Memorial Day meeting in a big city park. A big crowd was expected, but I figured I could handle a few sentences of an invocation, even though I was very young and very inexperienced. At the speaker's platform, I introduced myself to the chief speaker of the day, the late Colonel Theodore Roosevelt, Jr. This man was former President Theodore Roosevelt's son. He later served as a general in World War II and died on the beaches of Normandy. When I sat down and picked up the program, I discovered to my great consternation that I wasn't listed for the invocation at all. Instead, I was scheduled to deliver a speech preceding that of Colonel Roosevelt's. I rushed over to the master of ceremonies and chattered nervously that a big mistake had been made. Well, he said, matter-of-factly, if you're down for a speech, I just guess you'll have to give one. Colonel Roosevelt heard my protest and looked me over appraisingly. What's the matter, son, he asked. Are you afraid? I frankly admitted that the huge crowd had me petrified. 
and there was no way I could ever think up a speech in the next few minutes. Oh, yes, there is, he replied. First of all, stop telling yourself that you're scared. Start thinking courage and confidence. And another thing, I'd suggest that you stop thinking of yourself. He led me up to the front of the platform and drew my attention to a group of reserved seats, all occupied by women. Do you know who these women are, he asked. Before I could reply, he reminded me that each of those women had lost a son in the war. These mothers are sitting here today thinking of their beloved sons, perhaps remembering the days when they were small boys and had to be held by the hand or coaxed to sleep at night. They miss their boys. They have their sorrow. They are lonely and sad. Isn't there anything you can say to these mothers? Forget yourself and start feeling compassion. Then get up and give a talk just for them. Forget everyone else in the crowd if you want to. What you say to those mothers will certainly reach everyone here. You can do it, he asserted. Then came that powerful statement which has remained with me ever since. He said, look, Norman, all the resources you need are in your mind. Just draw on them, and you'll find that speech right there in that head of yours. Relax, start thinking, and it will come to you. He hit me affectionately on the back and said, think courage, put your whole self into it, Send out love to those people, and you will shake off that fear of yours. So I made my little speech, and I suppose it was okay. But it wasn't as great as he enthusiastically told me it was. But he was right about one thing. When you rely on your mind, it will deliver, provided you've put something into it. And that is doubly true when you forget yourself and sincerely try to do something to make life happier for other people. Forget yourself. Think courage. Believe that all the resources you need are in your mind. That is a formula that works, really works. Confidence and an assertive approach to difficulty are big parts of the winning personality. But most problems aren't solved overnight. Here's a look at another basic principle that's essential for success. When I think of the accomplished people I know, there's one quality they all have in common. Persistence. When you have a problem, even one that is especially difficult and baffling, perhaps even terribly discouraging. Remember this saying, the quitter never wins and the winner never quits. To give up is to invite complete defeat, and not only in connection with the matter at hand, giving up contributes to an ultimate defeat of your personality because it encourages you to develop a whole defeat mentality. If the methods you're using to solve a problem aren't working, then come at the problem a different way. And if the new approach doesn't work, then come at it still another way until you find the key to the situation. For there is a key. There always is. And continual thoughtful, undeviating search and attack will produce it. If you really want to win at something, the first thing to do is never talk defeat. Don't even allow the thought in your mind. If you do, you can actually talk yourself into acceptance of defeat. Indulging too often in negative language can be literally dangerous to your whole personality. Words like no and can't 
and delay and too difficult can set you back before you ever get started. Try instead to fill your conversation with upbeat words like yes and can and energy and no problem. But even more importantly, your thinking must change. To meet problems in a positive, constructive way, fill your mind with the thought that it is always too soon to quit. Indeed, the chance of really getting where you want to go in life often hinges on your reaction to some shattering setback. Will you give up or will you keep on trying? It's as simple as that. And what you decide decides your future. Did you ever hear of the thrilling career of Hayes Jones? Back in 1969, this man was the phenomenon of the year in high hurdles racing. He won race after race. He broke records. He was, in fact, sensational. Naturally, he was picked for the Olympic Games held that year in Rome. There he ran amid worldwide expectations that he would carry off the gold medal. But surprisingly, he didn't. He finished third. It was, of course, a keen disappointment, and his first thought was, so what? I might as well quit running. It was one of those turning points. The next Olympic Games were four long years away. Besides, he'd won all the other coveted high hurdles championships. Why subject himself to four more years of keeping in top form? The only sensible thing was to forget it and get started in a business career. That was plain logic for sure. But Hayes Jones couldn't settle for that. You can't be logical, he said, about something you've wanted all your life. So he started a grueling training regime again. And four years later, he entered a race at Madison Square Garden. He had announced that this would be his last indoor race. Tension ran high. Every eye was on him. And he won, tying his own previous all-time record. That night, 17,000 people packing the garden stood in tribute. Jones wept. Many spectators wept, too, because a once-defeated man had hung in there. He wouldn't quit, and the fans loved him for that. He entered the 1964 Olympics at Tokyo, and this time he finished first. He won his gold medal. Hayes Jones had that winning quality, persistence, the refusal to quit. As Edmund Burke, the great British statesman, said, Never despair, but if you do, work on in despair. When everything seems to be going wrong, that's the time to practice the positive mental belief that you can still achieve your objectives as long as you persist, as long as you try everything. If you start thinking it's hopeless, your state of mind will actually attract further trouble to defeat you. Instead, hold on to the thought that conditions will shift in your favor and get going. That's the kind of attitude that works wonders in handling problems. You can if you think you can. It's always too soon to quit, so don't quit. If you want to develop the set of mind that creates a winning pattern, here are a few suggestions. 1. Take a positive attitude toward your problems. When an obstacle gets in your way, don't complain. Look at it another way. Remember, every problem contains the seed of its own solution. 2. Trust yourself. Whatever the challenge, go all out. Abandon yourself to your goal and never let a doubt enter your mind. Confidence has magnetism. It draws wonderful results. 3. All the resources you need are in your mind. If you can think straight, even under pressure, 
the answer will come to you. 4. Be persistent. Don't give up. Remember, the quitter never wins, and the winner never quits. Dr. Peel talked about some of the qualities that winning people all seem to have in common. A positive approach to problems, confidence, persistence. He describes a few important methods that you can use to turn your problems around, to make them work for you, not against you. There is no end to the variety of problems that life can present, but one of the most common handicaps a person can have is that all too common sense of inferiority, the feeling that you just don't have what it takes to cope with the ordinary challenges of human existence. Over the years, I've come to realize that at least three procedures are vital to the successful handling of problems, knowledge, thought, and belief. Or to put it another way, know, think, and believe. Let's talk first about knowledge. A problem can take on larger-than-life dimensions when you fail to examine it thoroughly. At first glance, you may think you're facing a major catastrophe, and if that's how you approach it, it's understandable that you may not feel up to the job. This is when it is important to realize that almost any problem will yield to knowledge and understanding. Human intelligence at work has amazing power. When you study and analyze every facet of a problem and lay out all the pieces in an orderly fashion for scrutiny and decision, you frequently discover something crucial. The problem which seemed at first glance not only complex but also potentially destructive, now contains remarkable creative possibilities for a solution. I was once involved in a project with a man who was a real wizard at tackling problems. When a very difficult situation arose, something that had me completely baffled, I went to see him announcing, we have a problem. To this, he astonished me by saying, congratulations. But I declared, no fooling. This is a very tough problem. Still, he was unimpressed and said cheerily, in that case, double congratulations. Then he added, always remember that for every disadvantage, there is a corresponding advantage. I began to outline the situation. He listened carefully, his keen mind concentrating on and sorting the material as I spoke. He grasped the essence of the problem and proceeded to deal with it expertly. First he asked, have you made a complete and detailed study of all the factors involved? Do you honestly feel you are knowledgeable? He put my knowledge of the problem to the test by asking several searching questions. Then he asked me, is the organization of your material as clear and concise as it should be? Let's regroup it. He then engaged in a strange procedure, the effectiveness of which I have recalled many times and have used creatively on many problems. He walked around the table, making a kind of heaping motion with his hands, as though to bring all the elements of the problem together. Then he started poking at the accumulated problem with a long, gnarled forefinger. He had some arthritis, which had curved the finger and caused knobs to develop on the joints. But with that crooked finger... He could point straighter into the heart of a problem that most people can with a straight finger. Finally, he said, there's a soft spot in every problem. All you've got to do is to keep looking until you find it. 
Come here. I found a soft spot in this problem. He then worked his finger into that problem, sort of the way a dog works its teeth into a bone until he broke it into pieces. But there was now an orderly pattern in those pieces, and he found the answer. It proved to be a good solution, too. Just use your head, son, when a problem comes along, he advised. Study it until you are completely knowledgeable. Then find that weak spot, break the problem apart, and the rest will be easy. It seems that all successful problem solvers have a few things in common. They don't allow themselves to be overwhelmed by problems, and they certainly don't get frightened by them. Instead, they coolly and factually study the problem in depth and from all angles. They get advice from experts and others who have faced similar problems. They probe and examine and take the problem apart until there's nothing they don't know about it. In problem solving, this is a vital way to begin. Research, study, analyze. Dissect your problem until you understand it completely. Now for the next problem solving weapon, thought. Your mind is a great tool. If you learn to exercise mental calmness plus will and persistence, you can think your way through anything. When you're in the midst of a challenge, you may not realize it, but deeply buried in the unconscious, a process of problem solving is going on. Ideas for meeting the situation are trying to float to the surface. Remember that your mind always wants to help you and will if you permit it to do so, but panic, hysteria, even relatively mild emotions keep the surface of the mind in a state of disturbance, making it impossible for sound insights to rise from the deeper levels of consciousness. When a problem arises, tell you what you do. Take a deep breath. Take yourself resolutely in hand and insist upon reacting calmly. Achieve emotional balance and then firmly maintain it. I once read a story about an American sailor during the Korean conflict who really showed that he could think even in the most desperate of situations. It seems that an American destroyer lay at anchor in a harbor one clear, moonlit night. The quartermaster, making a routine check of the ship, suddenly stopped short. He saw a big black object floating not far off. Aghast, he realized at once that it was a floating contact mine, which had broken loose from a minefield and was slowly drifting with the ebbing tide toward the ship. Grabbing the intercom, he quickly summoned the captain and the duty officer to the scene. A general alarm was sounded. The entire ship went into action. Officers and men stared fearfully at the slowly approaching mine. Feverishly, the situation was appraised as disaster hung in the balance. Various suggestions were rapidly put forward by the officers. Should they up anchor? No, there wasn't time. Start the engines and shift the position of the ship? No, that wasn't feasible, for the propeller wash would only suck the mine inward more rapidly. Could the mine be exploded with gunfire? No, it was too close to the ship's magazine. What then should be done? Launch a boat and push it away with poles? This wouldn't work, for it was a contact mine and there was no time to disarm it. Tragedy seemed imminent. Suddenly, an ordinary seaman outthought all his superior officers. Get the fire hoses, he shouted. Everyone instinctively realized that his suggestion made sense. 
A stream of water was played into the sea between the ship and the floating mine, creating a current that carried the mine into waters where it was safely exploded by gunfire. Quite a man, that ordinary seaman. He had within himself the ability to think cool and straight in a crisis situation. Such abilities are definitely built into each of us, perhaps to a greater extent in some more than in others, but no normal human being is lacking in creative potential. No matter what difficulty or crisis affects your life, you can handle it, if only you think you can. Thinking positively about your ability tends to release positive mental forces that produce effective action. Sigmund Freud once said, The chief duty of a human being is to endure life. At first sight, that statement sounds heroic, and perhaps it is. Certainly it contains an element of profound truth. But if that were the whole story, life would be bleak indeed. I would rather take the position that the chief duty of a human being is to master life. And despite all its pain and difficulty, one can do just that. If he will think and work and study and believe and pray too. And that brings us to our third problem-solving factor, belief. The believer is confident. This person knows there is always an idea available which will lead to a solution of the problem. He or she then sets out to find that dynamic and creative idea using knowledge, thought, and persistence. If you're hampered by doubt, the cure begins when you decide that you really want to change when you become very determined and are able to say, I do want to believe in myself. You never really know what you can do until you try. And if you keep moving ahead with determination, thinking positively at all times, trying over and over again, you will not fail. If you feel you could improve your ability to believe, here are a few suggestions. They are simple, concrete things you can do each day. With repetition, thinking in this manner will become natural to you, and you will find that you are feeling more confident that you do believe in yourself. Whenever a negative thought about yourself comes to mind, deliberately voice a positive thought to cancel it out. Don't build up obstacles in your imagination. Minimize them instead. If you want to eliminate a difficulty, study it thoroughly, but always see it realistically. See it for what it really is. Never inflate a problem by fearful thoughts. Never think of yourself as failing. Such thinking can be very dangerous, for the mind always tries to complete what it pictures. Instead, stamp indelibly on your mind a mental picture of yourself succeeding. Repeat to yourself over and over and over, I can, I can, I can. That message will soon extinguish all thoughts to the contrary.
Problems and setbacks are ordinary parts of everyone's life. But mastering and enjoying life is not simply a matter of getting past today's problems. What about hopes, dreams, goals? Solving problems effectively will certainly take you closer to your goals. But now here's Dr. Peel to discuss what he calls the Law of Successful Achievement, a systematic approach for making dreams come true. We've all seen how people can sentence themselves to failure by constantly telling themselves all the things they can't do. But here's an example of a young man who never let such notions keep him down for long. His story began a long time ago in Kansas City. He was a young fellow with an urge to draw, and he went from newspaper to newspaper trying to sell his cartoons. But each editor informed him coldly and perhaps a bit cruelly that he had no talent and advised him to forget it. And yet this young man couldn't forget his dream, for it had grabbed him and wouldn't let him go. Finally, a pastor employed him for a pittance to draw advertising pictures for church events. Needing a place to sleep and to draw, he was told he could stay in a room over the church garage, a mouse-infested attic. And what do you know? One of those mice became famous around the world, as did the young artist. This was the birth of Mickey Mouse and the beginning of Walt Disney's legendary career. It was Demosthenes who observed small opportunities are often the beginnings of great enterprises. In those early days when he had scarcely two nickels to rub together and everyone was giving him the brush off, it would have been easy for Walt Disney to become sour and bitter. But he didn't. He just kept believing in himself and imagining and working until his dreams became quite real. He expected a miracle. And finally, that's what he got. The technique used by Walt Disney and by countless others to make their dreams become reality can be broken down into what I call the law of successful achievement. And here's how it works. First, you have to have a goal, not a vague, fuzzy goal, but a sharply focused objective. You must know where you want to go, what you want to be, and have no doubt about it. And here I'm referring to inner organization in which mind, spirit, and purpose operate in harmonious unity. Failure comes most often to people who are shattered unable to focus themselves. Everything seems to elude them. Their grasp is weak, their direction vague, their impact uncertain. If you want to do something and do it well, you have to get pulled together. That means organizing your entire being so that every element of your personality is operating harmoniously. With inner conflicts resolved and clarity established, all your talents get a go signal to function in a unified manner. People who are pulled together waste little energy. They never keep themselves from getting what they want. To get anywhere in life, you have to be motivated, and that motivation must be directed or channeled. You have to know what you want to do, what you can do best, where you want to go, and how to get there. This is a big part of being focused and organized. And to all this must be added deep desire, a driving force, and the willingness to work, 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 and never, never give up. 
The second step, a very practical part of this process, is to pray about your goal. You need to be sure that your objective is a right one because if it isn't right, it's wrong, and nothing wrong ever turned out right in the long run. The third part of this law of successful achievement is to picture your goal clearly and hold this image tenaciously in your conscious mind. Don't let it slip or fade. After a while, the goal will sink into your subconscious, and when you have it firmly fixed there, you've arrived. You have it. Why? Because it has you, all of you, your hopes, your thoughts, your efforts. Dynamic thinking like this affects the outcome of a situation because there is a deep tendency in human nature to become precisely like that which we habitually imagine ourselves to be. The word imagination actually implies imaging, and that is a very important part of achieving your goal. When you form a concrete image of yourself in the place or situation you long for and continually see yourself there and feel yourself there as if it were happening this minute without a doubt, one day you will be there. Another term for this imaging procedure is creative anticipation. The first time I heard this phrase was from a psychologist trying to help a young man who was caught in a spiraling pattern of repeated failure. He explained, the trouble with this young man is that subconsciously he always expects the worst to happen. With that expectation, his mind tends to picture that failure situation and then create it. To halt this process, he must be taught to expect the best and to confidently imagine successful outcomes. After a while, the practice of creative anticipation should teach him to believe in his own potential. And indeed, once the man learned to think confidently, he began expecting good things to happen, and they did. Gradually, this became his pattern. The person who visualizes himself achieving rather than failing and who is willing to pay the price of intensive study and sustained effort is the person who advances toward his goal. That mental vision is vital, for what we become is closely related to our basic self-image, what we think and what we visualize is to a large degree what we are bound to become. Years ago, I heard a story which has stayed with me because it confirms both the power of the self-image and the creative anticipation principle. At the risk of repetition, I give it here. It seems that a famous trapeze performer had a group of students, young people, who were eager to become performing stars. The class went through all the lesser stunts. Now the time came for each to perform on the high trapeze bar. All but one got through this test satisfactorily. This student looked up at the bar, and at once a negative self-image took over. He visualized the worst. One slip and he would plunge to the ground. He froze. He couldn't move a muscle. His imagination prevented him from performing. Terrified, the boy stammered, I can't. I cannot do it. I see myself falling. I just cannot do it. The older man stepped in. If I did not know you were capable, I would not ask you to do this. Look, I'll tell you how. First, throw your heart over that bar up there, and your body will follow. 
He meant, of course, to throw faith and confidence and an image of achievement over the difficulty, and the material part would follow along naturally. It was very wise advice. The boy's thinking unfroze. The mental image was changed, and he was finally able to pass his test without incident. Everyone faces crises. By anticipating the worst, we tend to freeze, unable to function properly. But by substituting the power of imagination, by imaging, throwing mind and heart over the obstacle, it can be overcome. The result inevitably follows the thrust of the mind. Now for the fourth element of successful achievement, put strong, positive thoughts behind your goal. Never let negative thoughts surround you, for the negative thinker unleashes destructive forces that can destroy him. It's the law of attraction at work. Like attracts like. Thoughts of a kind have a natural affinity. By sending out negative thoughts, the negative thinker activates the world around him negatively. He tends to draw back to himself negative results. The positive thinker, on the other hand, sends out optimistic thoughts and thus activates the world around him positively. On the basis of the same law of attraction, he draws back to himself positive thoughts. He works and keeps on working. He thinks and keeps on thinking. He believes and keeps on believing. He never lets up, never gives in. He gives the effort the full treatment of positive faith and action. Result, his dreams come true. He can because he thinks he can. As you encounter life's challenges, or as you dream your dreams, never write off anything as impossible. Remember, you have the mental capacity to think your way through any problem if you draw fully upon your mind. Think hopefully, get your mental powers really working, and things can turn out better than they now appear. Here are some proven techniques that can help you meet your setbacks head-on and accomplish your goals. Remember the problem-solving process. First, know. Get to know your problem. Study it until you find the soft spot, then break it apart. Second, think. Use your head. Your mind is a powerful tool. Stay cool and think straight. The answer is there if you let it come. Third, believe. Believe in yourself. Trust your ability to see your crisis through to the end. Repeat to yourself, I can, I can, I can. If you want to accomplish something, keep these thoughts in mind. Have a sharply focused goal. Pray about your goal to make sure it's right for you. Picture your goal clearly in your mind, and don't let that image fade. Work and keep on working. Always take a positive and optimistic attitude. When you maintain a positive frame of mind, good things are drawn to you, and ultimately they influence the outcome of your endeavors. Everyone encounters defeating factors in life, but those who think they can do not give in. By drawing upon their inner powers of mind and spirit, they simply refuse to be defeated. They know that even the most difficult situations can be overcome, so they proceed to overcome them. The hopeful thinker projects hope and faith, both miracle elements, into the darkest situation and lights it up. As long as you keep the crippling thought of defeat out of your mind, defeat cannot defeat you. 
You can be a winner. I'm Norman Vincent Peale. I hope you've enjoyed this, and I wish you the best things always. This has been a presentation of Simon & Schuster Audio.